Imagine this. You're looking up at the night sky. Somewhere out there, floating in the darkness, is a ship. Not a satellite, not a probe, but a real human spacecraft, headed to another world. But it's not the massive starship Elon Musk once promised. Instead, it's something sleeker, more efficient, and finally, something within reach. Welcome to the new reality of Mars exploration. Not just in concept, but in design, engineering, and achievable execution. It's the mini starship, and it might just be the most realistic path to Mars humanity has ever had. The dream of walking on Mars has always felt like it belonged to a distant future, the kind you'd see in science fiction novels or Hollywood blockbusters. For decades, we've looked at the red planet as a beacon of what could be, a second home, a new beginning, a survival plan. But now, with every passing month, that dream has been delayed, re-engineered, and for some even doubted. Because as bold and visionary as Elon Musk's Starship program is, the reality on the ground, or in space, has proven that getting to Mars isn't just about having a big rocket. It's about solving dozens of interconnected problems, all while keeping astronauts safe across a journey of over 200 million kilometers. Let's take a step back and understand where the challenge really begins. Elon Musk's plan, as laid out through SpaceX's official roadmap, relies on launching Starship into Earth orbit, where it would be refueled before heading off to Mars. Once it arrives, it has to land on a planet with an atmosphere just 1% as dense as Earth's. No parachutes. No helpful drag. Just raw engine power slowing it down. That means burning fuel, a lot of it, just to avoid crashing into the Martian surface. And that's only one leg of the journey. Once on Mars, Starship would be nearly empty. To make it back, astronauts would need to generate fuel directly on the red planet using Martian CO2 and water ice, a process called in-situ resource utilization. This isn't theoretical. NASA has already started testing it with MOXIE, a toaster-sized device that can extract oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. But MOXIE is tiny. To fuel a full-size starship for a return trip, you'd need to scale that up to an industrial level and run it continuously for over 500 days. That's assuming everything works perfectly. No breakdowns. No dust storms choking solar panels. And oh, you'd also need a small nuclear reactor to keep it powered through the cold Martian nights. Let's put some numbers on this. The dry weight of a starship is around 115 to 235 tons, depending on the configuration. To get from Mars back to Earth, even that empty shell would need more than 600 tons of propellant. And to get to Mars in the first place, it would need about 580 tons of fuel after being launched into orbit. That means you're looking at six separate launches, one main ship and five tankers, just to get it fueled up for the outbound trip. Then months of waiting on Mars while astronauts mine ice, extract CO2, and process it into fuel for the ride home. Even by Elon's standards, that's a big ask. This is where the brilliance of Dr. Robert Zubrin comes in. He's the aerospace engineer who first inspired Musk with his original Mars Direct proposal, a radically simpler plan for human Mars exploration. Now, Zubrin has returned with an evolved concept, known as Mars Direct 2. And at the center of it? A smaller, more agile spacecraft that cuts through many of the problems facing full-scale Starship missions. Enter, the Mini Starship. This isn't just a scaled-down toy version. The Mini Starship is a purpose-built, interplanetary workhorse. It weighs less, uses fewer engines, carries fewer astronauts, and, most importantly, demands a fraction of the fuel. Here's how the plan works. The full-size Starship doesn't go to Mars anymore. Instead, it acts as a delivery system, launching the Mini Starship into high Earth orbit. From there, the Mini Craft continues the journey alone, while the main Starship returns to Earth, refuels, and prepares for the next delivery. Think of it like a cosmic shuttle service, ferrying smaller, more efficient ships into deep space. The result is a game-changer. The Mini Starship requires five times less fuel for the trip to Mars, making it drastically easier to refuel and launch. It doesn't need to carry 100 passengers, just a small crew, maybe 6 to 10 scientists, engineers, and explorers. That's plenty for early missions. And because it weighs less, landing on Mars is safer and easier with far less stress on the engines during descent. Once on the surface, the crew sets up shop, deploys instruments, performs geological studies, runs life support systems, and begins collecting samples. And here's the real breakthrough. The mini Starship only needs about one-sixth the fuel of the full-size version to make the return trip. That means instead of generating 600 tons of fuel on Mars, you might only need 100. That slashes the operational time and power requirements by a huge margin. It makes missions shorter, safer, and far more achievable. And best of all, it allows for more frequent launches and returns, 
we're not waiting 26 months for the next Mars transfer window and then years for the crew to come home. Of course, the mini version doesn't carry as much payload. But Zubrin's estimates show that with a dry mass of around 20 tons, it could still deliver 50 tons of useful cargo. That's not insignificant. In fact, it's enough to bring a nuclear power module, life support systems, habitat inflatables, scientific gear, and still have room for food, water, and emergency supplies. Imagine being able to send those essential systems to Mars regularly, and with less risk. That's the real beauty of the plan. Now let's talk power. Mars, as beautiful and mysterious as it is, can be incredibly hostile. Dust storms can rage for weeks and cover the entire planet. One such storm in 2018 ended NASA's Opportunity rover mission, a robot that had exceeded all expectations. The storm cut off sunlight, drained the batteries, and brought its mission to a silent end. That's why depending solely on solar panels isn't smart. Instead, the plan involves deploying a small nuclear reactor to keep essential systems running regardless of weather. It's not sci-fi, the U.S. Department of Energy has already been working with NASA on Kilo Power, a compact fission reactor built for exactly this purpose. So with a few flights of mini starships, we could set up a modular base, powered by nuclear energy, staffed by a small team and constantly resupplied by additional missions. Think about that. Not a one-shot heroic landing, but the beginning of a sustained human presence on another planet. That's the kind of mission we can plan, execute and refine, not once but again and again. We could learn from each trip. Bring back more data train future astronauts, improve equipment, shorten timelines, and one day, maybe within our lifetime, build a real settlement. And this idea is gaining traction. Students, engineers, and industry experts are rallying behind the concept. One of its rising advocates is Migo Hera, a space enthusiast from Spain who expanded the plan into Mars Direct 3.0, a more refined blueprint using four dedicated spacecraft for mission phases. With community support, open science, and incremental goals, Mars doesn't have to be a fantasy anymore. It can be a destination. This isn't just about rockets or fuel. It's about who we are as a species. Are we willing to adapt when our first plan doesn't work? Are we humble enough to admit that maybe going smaller, not bigger, gets us there faster? That kind of thinking isn't weakness. It's wisdom. It's evolution. And it's how real exploration begins. So now, the question isn't whether we'll go to Mars. It's how we'll do it. Will we cling to the oversized dreams that keep slipping away? Or will we embrace the designs that get us moving? One launch, one crew, one mission at a time? If you believe in this mission, if you're inspired by the idea of a smarter path to Mars, don't just watch. Be part of the movement. Drop a comment below. Would you go to Mars if given the chance? Like this video if you think the mini starship is the future. Share it with someone who dreams of walking on another world. And don't forget to subscribe because the next chapter of human history is about to be written in Martian soil. And remarkably, even if three out of the four ships were to fail, the mission wouldn't be a complete disaster. The crew could still survive. That's not optimism. That's engineering built with redundancy at its core. So how does this ambitious architecture protect against catastrophic failure? The answer lies in how the mission is structured, particularly in the Mars Direct 3.0 plan which spreads risk intelligently across multiple launch windows and multiple vehicles. It starts with the first launch window, two years before any human sets foot on Mars. In this phase, SpaceX sends two ships, a full-size cargo starship, designated Ship A, and a smaller, uncrewed mini starship, called Mini A. These ships are critical to setting up the infrastructure needed for the crew's eventual survival. Ship A is essentially the fuel factory. It's fitted with everything required to produce methane and oxygen on Mars. CO2 collectors, Sabatier reactors, hydrogen tanks, and a full suite of solar-powered rovers to support operations. The system is designed with contingencies. If extracting water from Martian ice proves impossible, stored hydrogen can still be combined with atmospheric CO2 to produce fuel, ensuring Mini-A has what it needs to return home. Mini-A, though uncrewed, isn't just an empty shell. It's a fully operational habitat designed for humans. It comes equipped with life support systems, food, oxygen recycling, a waste management system, and enough water and provisions for two years. It's also equipped with two backup electrolysis units for generating breathable oxygen and includes its own rover for surface mobility. This redundancy isn't just a safety measure. It's a life-saving design, preparing the Martian surface long before the first crew even arrives. Then, two years later, during the next launch window, Mini-B makes its way to Mars. This is the first crewed spacecraft in the mission. 
the astronauts arrive not to build from scratch but to occupy and activate systems that have already been in place and tested for years. They immediately begin surface exploration, scientific operations, and, perhaps most critically, deploy a fuel transfer rover. This rover connects the systems from Ship A to both Mini A and Mini B, allowing fuel to be shared and moved where it's needed most. It's a modular approach to resource allocation, an elegant and reliable backup in case any system fails. Finally, the fourth ship arrives, Starship B. This cargo vessel brings the big hardware, large-scale ice mining equipment, a pressurized rover capable of long-range excursions, and the early modules of a long-term Martian habitat. These components transform the mission from a temporary scientific stay into the beginnings of a real colony. The crew can now travel hundreds of kilometers from the landing site, access deeper Martian terrain, and collect broader samples, while also laying the groundwork for more permanent operations. And here's the brilliance of the Mars Direct 3.0 strategy. Even if one of the starships doesn't land properly, or if a major subsystem fails, the entire mission doesn't collapse. The redundancy, modularity, and staggered timing allow the crew to adapt and survive. That's not just good planning. That's how we build the first outpost on another planet. Now, let's zoom out and consider how Starship itself has evolved to support this vision. The original Starship V1 already changed the game. Standing at over 121 meters tall, taller than the Statue of Liberty, it was built to carry 100 tons of cargo or 100 passengers at a time. It looked like something from a science fiction film, yet it was grounded in real-world engineering. But Elon Musk didn't stop there. As testing progressed and capabilities expanded, SpaceX began developing the even larger Starship V2. This new version featured an extended upper stage, stretching the spacecraft to over 124 meters in height. It was designed to carry up to 150 tons of payload, a significant jump in capacity. However, early V2 prototypes like S33 through S36 faced major challenges. Most failed during tests, often due to Raptor engine complications. Only S-36 made it to the test stand before suffering a COPV failure. While setbacks like these could demoralize other programs at SpaceX, failure is treated as fast-track data. That's why, as these tests were underway, engineers were already constructing the next version in parallel, the Starship V-3. Starship V-3 isn't just another iteration. It's a complete transformation. With a height of 150 meters when paired with the Super Heavy Booster, V-3 is now the tallest launch vehicle ever constructed. It features the next-gen Raptor 53 engines, improved avionics, optimized heat shielding and far superior flight control systems. Its body is still stainless steel, sleek, reflective and durable, but now polished to aerodynamic perfection. The once imperfect welds have been replaced by precise joints, the fins redesigned not just for aesthetics, but for controlled re-entry and landing precision. This is no longer an experimental rocket. It's a refined, powerful interplanetary machine. And inside that shell? Starship V-3 carries six vacuum-optimized Raptor engines and three sea-level Raptors, giving it the versatility to operate in both terrestrial and interplanetary environments. Whether launching from Earth or taking off from the surface of Mars, V-3 is built to perform, consistently and reliably. It's the vehicle that will carry the hopes of millions, and maybe one day your friends, your kids, or even you. But Elon Musk has hinted at something even bigger. A next-generation Starship, Starship 4.0, is already being whispered about. It's not just taller. It's broader. While current Starships are 9 meters in diameter, this version would double that, stretching to an unprecedented 18 meters. That's not just scaling, that's reimagining the limits of launch capability. Why go so big? Because scaling up means launching fewer vehicles. Instead of 1,000 Starships needed every 26 months to deliver materials and crew to a Martian colony, an 18-meter-wide starship could cut that number down to 250. The same applies to orbital refueling. With larger propellant tanks, fewer tanker launches would be required. This saves time, cost, and risk, all crucial when managing thousands of tons of payload and hundreds of people. But here's where it gets exciting. These super-heavy starships could do more than just transport. Once they reach Mars, they could be converted into living spaces. Empty fuel tanks could be repurposed into radiation-shielded quarters. Compartments could be turned into labs, greenhouses, or communal areas. A spacecraft could become a base. This kind of dual-purpose design changes the economics and logistics of Mars colonization entirely. Of course, building a vehicle of this magnitude isn't easy. The Star Factory would need to scale up, 
and gigafactories capable of producing 18-meter wide steel rings are still in planning. The production requirements are enormous, thicker rings, larger fuel tanks, new welding techniques, but they're all within reach. And given SpaceX's history of delivering on impossible timelines, it's only a matter of time. Before we leap to interplanetary colonization though, Starship will have a more immediate use, intercontinental flights. The very same system that can launch to Mars can also take people from New York to Tokyo in under an hour. That's not just about speed, it's about revolutionizing the way we think about global travel. Major stakeholders, from NASA to the U.S. Department of Defense, are already investing in Starship's future. NASA has officially selected Starship to serve as the lunar lander for Artemis III, a historic confirmation of its reliability and importance. That selection means a boom in Starship launches is coming. Launch pads across the country are being prepared, Starbase in Texas, LC-39A at Kennedy Space Center, and SLC-37 at Cape Canaveral. Starbase will continue as the R backslash and D center. LC-39A, which once sent Apollo astronauts to the moon, will now handle civilian and scientific missions, including Mars flights. SLC-37 will be optimized for national security missions, under full military command with up to 76 launches per year. And the Gigafactory to support it all? It's coming. This massive facility will manufacture hundreds of starships annually, even ones big enough for Mars city building. With launch frequency increasing across all three sites, 25 missions per year from Starbase, 44 from LC-39A, and dozens more from SLC-37, Starship is no longer just a rocket. It's becoming an infrastructure, a transportation network, a gateway to the stars. Mars isn't just a dream anymore. It's a plan. And not just a plan sketched on a napkin, but one laid out in engineering drawings, test flights, and production lines. Starship, from Mini to V3 and eventually 4.0, is evolving faster than anyone thought possible. Each version learns from the last. Each failure is fuel for the next breakthrough. And together, they form a system that might one day carry humanity to a second home. So, what does the future look like? It looks like a stainless steel colossus rising into the sky. It looks like astronauts waving from the red sands of Mars. And it looks like you, watching, learning, supporting, maybe even dreaming of joining them one day. If you believe this future is worth chasing, help us spread the word. Like this video. Subscribe to the channel. Share it with your friends. Drop a comment. Would you live on Mars if given the chance? This story isn't just about rockets. It's about people. It's about us. And the next chapter is just getting started.